it's a great pleasure to be here with uh, today's guest, Christophe Pomian, uh, whom uh, almost all of us know through his works. Um, before we start our conversation, I just want to uh, do our customary land acknowledgement, but this time in a non-customary way, since we're at the first anniversary of a poem that we commissioned uh, from Campbell McGrath that was published uh, first in the New Yorker exactly a year ago called At the Ruins of Yankee Stadium. And then most recently in the book for which it was commissioned, What is Research? Um, I'll take the land acknowledgement from there by reading some of its lines. Certainly this is not the eternal city, but it is certainly imperial, certainly tyrannical, democratic, demagogic, dynastic, anarchic, hypertrophic, hyperreal, an empire of rags and photons, an empire encoded in the bricks from which it was built, each a stamped emblem of its labor intensive materiality, hundreds of millions barged down the Hudson each year from the clay pits of Haverstraw and Kingston after the great fire of 1835, a hinterland of dependencies, quarries and factories and arterial truck farms delivering serum to that muscular heart, a toiling collective of Irish sand hogs and Iroquois beam walkers and Ivorian umbrella vendors collecting kindling for the bonfire that has lured like moths the entire world to its blaze. And then we skip a few lines. Acorns, tossing them into the Hudson River from a bench as I did when I was Peter Stuyvesant, when I was Walt Whitman, when we were of the Lenape and Broadway, our hunting trail. Then the deer vanished, the docks decayed, the towers fell. The African graveyard was buried beneath concrete as the memory of slavery has been obscured by metonymy and willful amnesia. That's Campbell McGrath. So we're here today with Christoph Pomian, uh, the great Polish French historian, the pioneer, one would have to say, of the history of collecting in its most recent, and when I say most recent, I mean since the 1970s, he has been writing essays collected in several kinds of volumes, many of you may know, L'Anticomanie, uh, Collectionneur Amateur et Curieux, published in English as uh, Collections and Curiosity in 1990 by Cambridge. And most recently, on the occasion for this gathering, the publication of the first two volumes of what will be three volumes, Le Musée Une Histoire Mondiale, uh, Global History uh, of the Museum. Uh, and we're here to celebrate the publication and also to have this opportunity to talk with someone whose work uh, really has been central to uh, that of so many of us here at the Bard Graduate Center. So I'm going to ask uh, Christoph just to say a few words to begin uh, about this book project. Christoph? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. And uh, well, uh... Uh, the book is scheduled to have three volumes. The third volume will appear in somewhere in March, end of February, March of uh, the next year. And now the, 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 the master plan, so to say, of, of, of the book is as following. The first volume is uh, devoted to uh, history of collections which uh, later will uh, end uh, in museums. Uh, and also uh, it's, a, so to say, a prehistory of museum. Uh, history of treasuries and therefore also history of uh, private collections and therefore also history of all, I would say, a human side of a museum. Museum, it's not, on, not, not only a collection and a building, it's also a lot of people who know what to do with all this stuff, uh, who know how, how to handle objects, how to preserve objects, how to classify objects, how to appreciate objects. So, uh, 
this prehistory ends somewhere in the 15th century, at the end of the 15th century, with the appearance of first museums in Italy. And the rest of the first volume is devoted to what I used to call privately as the Italian period in the history of museums. It's a very, it's a very long period when uh, history of museum is dominated by Italy as a, a source of models, uh, examples, uh, which later uh, will be followed uh, elsewhere. But uh, at the beginning, this is a histo uh, the history of museum is history of Italian museum, despite uh, its spread in Europe since the end of the 17th century. Uh, now the second volume starts with the French Revolution, which is an extremely important event in the history of museum. And uh, the volume, uh, all the second volume is devoted, so to say, to the museum uh, in the light or in the shadow, uh, it depends upon your judgment of the French Revolution. Uh, there are uh, very important decisions taken in France, uh, which will have uh, an impact on uh, all other European countries practically. And uh, so I start with the history of museums in France at the time. And then uh, I go through Spain, uh, uh, United Kingdom, uh, uh, Germany, uh, what we used to call Germany, it's uh, plenty of different states. And uh, it's important uh, to take uh, this political diversity into account. And uh, this second volume ends with Denmark, which is perhaps not a great country, which, but which during a, a brief period in the history of museums was one of the uh, greatest powers in the field, in the States, in, uh, uh, because it created uh, several exemplary, uh, intro it introduced several exemplary innovations into the museum business. And now uh, we end this, this volume ends with uh, the uh, ex exposition of industrial formations, uh, the universal exhibition uh, in London uh, in 1851, which is the entrance the very entrance of museum into the period of another revolution, this time the industrial revolution. And the third volume uh, is devoted to the history of museum in the time of industrial revolution or industrial revolutions, as you wish. Uh, and uh, it studies the propagation of museum from Western Europe, uh, which uh, all this uh, history started, or uh, to be more precise, uh, it uh, describes the, um, transformations of museums of museum in Western Europe in the late 19th century uh, until the First World, World War, or sometimes until the Second World War, it depends. Uh, upon uh, the logic of subject. And then it studies the propagation of museum in Central Europe, in Russia, in uh, Ottoman Empire, and in Egypt, in the United States. There is a very long part of this volume devoted to the history of museums in the United States from uh, Peel uh, to Pay, so to say. Uh, and then uh, there is also uh, the propagation of museum uh, 
uh, with the European colonization, uh, it's the problem of Latin America and Australia, and uh, very interesting cases of Japan, Japan and of China. And uh, the last part of the third volume is devoted to the 20th century since the First World War, to the effects of the First World War on museums, uh, immediate effects, distractions, uh, restitutions, and so on. And uh, uh, long-term effects uh, and in indirect long-term effects connected in particular to the appearance after the First World War of a very uh, completely new political regime until then, Ankno, which is a totalitarian regime, and uh, uh, the development of museums in totalitarian countries, I mean, uh, Soviet Union, uh, the Bolshevik Soviet Union, uh, the Nazi Germany, and fascist Italy. The last case is the less interesting because uh, the intervention of political power uh, into uh, museums was perhaps uh, lesser than uh, in the case of Nazi Germany and uh, of, Soviet, of the Soviet Union. And this uh, leads us uh, to the disaster of the Second World War, which is uh, an, enormous, an enormous, enormous event in the history of museum and generally of the distribution of cultural goods. Uh, and to the last uh, 70 years, uh, since the end of the Second World War, uh, which uh, until uh, quite recently, until uh, the beginning of the uh, pandemic, pandemics, uh, was placed under the aegis of uh, uh, always greater, uh, of an increase of collections, of uh, buildings, of number of visitors, of everything. And then with the pandemics, all this system went in crisis. So for, for the inter perhaps if I, if I may, uh, I would add uh, some sentences to this. Behind this history, because it's a strictly historical book, but behind this history is a theory. And I would like perhaps to say a couple of words about this theory, uh, to summarize it in four sentences, uh, not to be very long. First of all, for me, history of museums is a chapter in the history of collecting. And history of collecting is not as uh, some authors proposed, a history of collectors, but it is a history of changing historical times of collections, uh, types, sorry, uh, changing historical types of collections. Museum is one of historical types of collection, neither the first, neither the last. Uh, this is the first point. Second point is that collections are at the same time instrument and products, products of the exchange between the visible and in the invisible. Uh, I mean, between the world given to the senses and the world uh, given, say, to the, to the imagina in, uh, imagination, to make a long uh, story short. Uh, uh, this, his this historical types, uh, which succeeds one another, and this is my third point, uh, are uh, small sets of sacred objects uh, present among uh, hunter ga hunters gatherers. Then there are uh, treasuries which uh, start modestly but, which, but become enormous uh, in the case of sacred monarchies, private collection is a very 
unusual phenomenon, uh, treasuries are universal. Everywhere where we have a sacred monarchy, we have a treasury. Uh, private collections are appeared historically in two distinct places in China, somewhere in the second century uh, before our era, and in Rome, more or less in the same moment. Uh, and then they appeared in uh, Western Christendom uh, in the uh, 14th century. Uh, well, uh, and my fourth point uh, is that history of collecting is uh, strongly connected to and dependent upon the history of beliefs, of beliefs. I mean by that not only religious beliefs, there are, for instance, ideological beliefs, very important in the 20th century. And so, uh, all this history of collecting and history of museum, which is immersed in the history of collecting, must be, and I try to do this in a book. So, to connect it to this changing history of human beliefs, of representations, in other words, of uh, the reality which isn't accessible to our senses, but which uh, nonetheless we consider as, as real or sometimes even as more real than the world uh, uh, which is uh, uh, around us. So I stop here. Uh, well, that's... Uh... That was great. I'm so uh, grateful to you for appending those four points. I think um, I came in with many questions to ask and, and you've stimulated more and I'm sure my colleagues will have their own questions for later. But just that last point that you made. Um, so are, are you saying that the, the book that you've written in the form that you have written it could have been written also as a work of anthropology, let's say, or as a work of philosophy, that the, the way in which museums and their, uh, and their underlying histories of beliefs uh, means that the story could be told in different ways by different professionals looking through the museum at, in your case, you're writing about history, but the philosopher could a Hegelian approach could see museums in terms of the history of beliefs or an anthropologist could do the same. Do you think that's right? That the museum is a kind of, um, a kind of prism through which we can look back at these kinds of fundamental questions? Yes, I think so. I think so. And uh... It's, uh, it's not unimportant to our subject that I started as a, as a philosopher. My background, my studies uh, were not uh, studies of history uh, and uh, certainly not of art history. I was very far from that uh, at the beginning and I arrived at it uh, very lately in my life. Uh, but I started as a philosopher. Uh, well, uh, it was at the beginning a Marxist, Leninist philosophy, not the best introduction, perhaps, uh, to philosophy. But uh, times changed quickly, and uh, later we had um, a very good philosophy and very good professors. So, uh, and, uh, and, uh, my uh, my attitude with respect to collecting and museums started also with philosophical questions, philosophical anthropological. It's it's very difficult to distinguish uh, between these two. And history was conceived. Uh, it was uh, our position uh, as some kind of a tool. Uh, 
to resolve questions which otherwise um, uh, give place to rhetorical exercises, which may be more or less interesting, but which uh, uh, don't learn uh, much. Thank, thank you. Um, you, uh, you talk about the museum. Uh, in the introduction, you make a distinction between museum and library and archive. And uh, I'm wondering, do, do you see each of these institutions as, as promoting or supporting a different kind of scholarly method? In other words, is, to put it very simply, crudely, is a museum scholar different from a library scholar, different from an archive scholar? So is the difference between them epistemological or is the difference between them the type of material only that they, that they hold? Uh, to some extent, it is an epistemological uh, uh, difference between, uh, between the three. Well, uh, library and archive uh, are, uh, uh, so to say, uh, close uh, neighbors, uh, and uh, both uh, require reading as uh, as a way to to knowledge. Uh, in the case of museum, it's much more difficult because. Uh, it requires seeing and it requires from a student and not from a casual visitor, uh, a manipulation of objects. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's, it's uh, in a sense, uh, a working museum. I mean, a working museum is much more uh, 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 akin to, uh, uh, archaeology uh, than to reading in a library, it seems to me. And is therefore, is, is part of the history of museums connected to, to the value placed on reading? In other words, has, has collecting and types of collections and museums as a human practice been paid less attention to because university trained scholars give more attention to disciplines based on reading than disciplines based on seeing or touching. No, but it, it depends. Uh... Uh, who is the university trained scholar, and uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's a fact that, uh, for instance, a historian uh, uh, is uh, uh, historical studies uh, uh, don't leave much of place. Uh, I leave aside archaeologists uh, to uh, the relation with objects. And uh, I know, I know, I don't know whether it's true everywhere, but in the time of my uh, university studies, uh, you could uh, spend five years uh, at the history department without uh, going to the museum unless you are an art historian, obviously, or archaeologist. Uh, so, uh, 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 this is, uh, this still is this difference, but it seems to me, it's, uh, it's very hypothetical. It's that uh, we are assisting at the change in the, historical works. Uh, 
going more and more just to objects. Uh, this started, it seems to me, at the end of the 19th century, and in particularly uh, with a very specialized field of the history, I mean the agrarian history. I think about the hist historians like Mark Bloch, for instance, or about Siedlungsgeschichte of Ger uh, in Germany at the end of 19 and the beginning of the 20th century. This was already a history, so to say, object-oriented, object-oriented. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, more and more today, uh, in particularly working on contemporary and recent history, uh, people are looking on objects uh, much more than they did this, uh, say, 50 years ago. Why, uh, within the world of museum types, within the world of museum types, why do you think the art museum became the dominant one, the dominant type for so long? I am not sure whether one can say that it became a dominant type. It's true uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, so to say, it's a common opinion about museums. But when you look on statistics, uh, the most numerous museums are not art museums. Art museums are uh, a minority. Uh, uh, so, uh, but this minority is uh, uh, very impressive. It's very spectacular. It's also somehow strongly connected uh, uh, to uh, the uh, social hierarchy. Uh, art museums were already much more connected uh, to uh, upper strata of uh, ancien regime society than, for instance, uh, natural history museums. And today it's also true, uh, it's enough uh, 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 to look uh, at the Metropolitan, uh, you are just nearby, uh, to see that among many other things, it's also some kind of uh, memorial uh, to uh, financial elites of uh, New York and not only New York. Uh, so, uh, in this sense, Veblen was perhaps uh, a bit mistaken, speaking about conspicuous consumption and introducing in it also uh, art, because uh, it happens in the United States particularly that private art collections sooner or later ended their life in museums and became public collections. So uh, it's not indifferent. But once more, I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, in, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the imagine, collective imagination, really art museums are uh, dominant. But uh, once more, uh, it's one type of museum among others. And statistically, they are minority. I have, uh, I'm going to ask only one more question, and then we will open it up to our panel. So my last question, um, reading through the first volume in particular, I was struck by the important power of antiquity as a promoter or as a kind of a generator of the museum. What is there something special about antiquity in its relationship to collecting that that is different from other types of objects that are collected? Yes, there is uh, something special, uh, I believe. Uh, and uh, it's simply the fact that museum is really a byproduct of, 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 of the uh, rediscovery of antiquity in the uh, uh, Western Christendom, uh, 
uh, of what we used to call Renaissance. Uh, and uh, 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 so there is this, and this is a very strong nexus. Uh, antiquity, moreover, uh, not only uh, uh, not only gave us, uh, we inherited from it our idea of museum, uh, modifying and secularizing an ancient religious institution, which was a temple of muses. But uh, it gave us also uh, a model of what is art and what is beauty, which survived uh, uh, until uh, the 19th century, practically in the second half of the 19th century. Uh, so, uh, uh, and once more, uh, uh, this particular place of antiquity, uh, and I mean by that Greek Roman antiquity, to be precise, uh, uh, makes it uh, even today, uh, gives it uh, even today a privileged place somehow in, in our representations. Thank you. So, so now I'm going to, uh, to ask uh, my colleagues on, on the panel to turn their cameras on and, uh, and then we'll take some questions uh, if we have them from, from the panelists before we open it more generally to the audience online. So panelists, good to see you. Um, and the floor is now open for questions. So I have uh, Will Stenhouse and then Deborah Crone and Aaron Glass. Um, can, so thank you very much for introducing this and for um, you know, speaking to us over the ocean. Um, I wondered, you know, I, I'm a great fan of your earlier work, but I have to admit I haven't read the, the latest work, but I wondered if when you're talking about a global history of museums, whether you see this very much as, as something that, that emerged in Europe and spread, or whether you can argue that, um, you know, Western museums in the 20th century have adopted something from the rest of the world. I, I wondered what sort of model you have, because, you know, clearly in the US, this is, you know, a deeply, uh, you know, fraught and discussed subject at the moment. So Christoph, the question is really about the model for talking about the global. Is it a European institution that globalized itself through European expansion, imperialism, colonialism? in the 19th century, or is global something that includes different ways of doing the same thing in different places? No, I, 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 I'm happy, uh, perhaps, uh, it's a European institution which globalized in the course of history due, as you said, uh, uh, to colonialism, uh, particularly if we look at this phenomenon, uh, very, uh, how to say, very large uh, colonization of uh, North America, uh, for instance. Uh, so uh, mm -hmm. uh, it was the uh, expansion of Europeans in the world which uh, globalized museum to some extent, but it's a bit more difficult than that because uh, at the same time, uh, the modernization once more uh, under also the pressure of, of uh, European powers of the United States uh, was understood as uh, 
requiring a museum as an institution. And from this point of view, the Japan is an extremely interesting case because uh, in Japan, uh, uh, museum is at the same time uh, an institution borrowed from uh, uh, United States and Europe and uh, Japanese uh, send uh, a real, uh, real uh, uh, expeditions to study uh, these institutions and the Marcosa uh, museums. And at the same time, it is somehow rooted in the Japanese tradition. They succeeded to do that. Uh, no, not every country succeeded to do that. Not every country had, uh, uh, so to say, uh, uh, um, preconditions uh, so favorable, is, if this is the correct word, to, to the reception of museum. But uh, even countries where the museum was at the beginning imposed by Europeans, somehow uh, transformed it uh, uh, and, uh, uh, so to say, the, uh, the Chinese museum is not exactly the European museum and the uh, European museum is not the Indian museum. Uh, so it's a complex process uh, of assimilation of this institution and at the same time of learning of this institution, learning which European also uh, 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 had to, had to uh, acquire. And just on this point, you were talking about Japan, a uh, question popped up from the audience. Is there something specific also about museum culture in India that, that belongs in this uh, spectrum of adaptation and response? Yes, it seems to me uh, there is something specific. There is something specific. Uh, from this point of view, there is a, a striking difference between uh, the assimilation of museum in societies like Indian or Japanese or Chinese, and in uh, societies which hadn't neither the tradition of private collecting, like China and Japan, uh, and India uh, also, uh, uh, nor uh, nor a complex nor a tradition of. Uh, public treasuries and uh, uh, and in such countries uh, museum uh, arrived lately and only now becomes to be uh, uh, assimilated uh, thank you um the next question uh deborah Sure, thank you very much for that overview of your work. Um, I look forward to reading all of it at some point, which I have not done yet. I wanted to ask a question, which um, I think a lot of us in, in this sort of larger field, and I'm looking at all the attendees here, um, there's, there's been a lot of talk for, for several years already about the end of the museum. You know, So my question is, is, is the museum an institution that is going to adapt and change with with the times. The pandemic is just the latest challenge to museums, the um, decolonizing movements, the challenges ideologically to the idea of a museum, um, the financial challenges of maintaining a museum. Is this something that you see? Is there a museum age that is at an end, or will museums be able to reinvent themselves to rise to all these challenges? Uh, may I ask Peter for help? Because sure. so, yeah. 
I explained it, uh, to him my problems with uh, spoken English, so to say. So, so Christoph, the question is, is the age of the museum over? Is it finished? The uh, pandemic, repatriation, decolonization. I mean, some of the, the, the Sar Savoir report in France, the crisis of the Humboldt Forum, do all of these mark the end of the museum age in European history? No, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, what uh, uh, decolonization, uh, on the contrary, uh, propagates the museum. And we have, uh, for instance, uh, one example of that is the problem of restitution, uh, which uh, now is uh, openly discussed and some measures are already taken to uh, uh, restitute objects which were uh, illegally uh, uh, transferred from uh, colonies to metropolis. Uh, as you know, uh, for instance, the problem of bronzes uh, from Benin Kingdom uh, is already open uh, and uh, some uh, so, but, but this uh, means uh, that uh, former colonies wish to have their museums how these museums will evolve later this I don't know and nobody knows but I don't think that there is the end of museum age. If something opens the rather gloomy perspective of the end of the museum age, uh, it's first the pandemics, which uh, put into question uh, the model of development of museums which was, uh, which operated uh, say since the 1960s or 1950s until two years, two or three years ago. And the second point, uh, the second cloud, so to say, and very, very black cloud on the horizon of museums uh, is, in my opinion, the propagation of the ecologist ideology with its apocalyptic visions of the vision of the future. Uh, because I don't see how can one reconcile uh, the perspective of the future, which is, so to say, inbuilt in the very institution of museum. The museum is an institution which has to transmit its collection to as distant future as possible in as good a state as possible. But this presumes that this future will be somehow to some extent similar to the present. And this presumes that the people of future will be interested uh, in what we are interested. But uh, in the apocalyptic vision of uh, catastrophism and cataclysm, uh, one can uh, have a doubt about uh, about the possibility of museums surviving uh, in the world of catastrophes, ecological catastrophes. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, the next question is uh, Aaron Glass. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the talk. Um, I, ha I had this question before the Q&A when you did mention that your background was in Marxist-Leninist philosophy. But my question is, <clears throat> you mentioned in the book uh, 
that you deal with totalitarianism uh, after World War I in Europe. And my question is very simple, is do you, do you also deal specifically with capitalism as a formation before and especially after as it spread with the museum around the world? Uh, then I deal with capitalism. I, uh, have I understood you well? There, there's something wrong with the image. I think I think Aaron's question is whether there is um, a part of the story of museums that could be presented also as a chapter in the history of capitalism. To some extent, certainly yes. To some extent, certainly yes. It's it's a chapter in the history of capitalism, in the chapter in the history uh, of uh, bourgeoisie, for instance. Uh, and uh, all, uh, all the history of museums, for instance, well, I take an example. It's different, it depends upon countries. But for instance, in a country, uh, let's, it's called Germany, because there were very huge differences between Prussia, for instance, and cities like Hamburg or kingdoms like Saxony. But almost everywhere in Germany. We have museums which were created uh, by burghers. And the museum was an institution of uh, uh, Bildungsbürgertum, of this educated bourgeoisie. And the phenomenon is not only German. Uh, if you uh, look on uh, France or on Italy, you find everywhere plenty of museums which were created by an industrialist, a financier, a banker. Uh, they, were, they were not necessarily uh, Morgans. They were much modest than that. But they, and they created museums. So in this sense, uh, you, you're perfectly right. Uh, the history of museum cannot be isolated from the history, general history of capitalism, of social transformations, which it brought with it, and of uh, social classes, uh, which are uh, uh, products of the Industrial Revolution. There is a very great difference between the museum from before the Industrial Revolution and the museum from after the Industrial Revolution. And this difference may be uh, summarized in one word. word. Uh, it's a democratization of museum. The real, democratiza the real democratization of museum starts, well, uh, to some extent with the French Revolution, but uh, I am a bit skeptical about that. Really, it starts in England with uh, this enormous show of 1851 and with, with a museum, which was a byproduct of the exhibition. At the time, it was called South Kensington Museum. And it's a first example of a democratic museum uh, with hours of opening such as to enable the working people to come in. Uh, the creator of this museum, Henry Cole, Sir Henry Cole, uh, 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 had, an had an agreement with a company of buses, horse driving buses at the time, uh, to have a stop just before the entrance of museum. So he looked for people who come, who comes by public transportation and not by their proper means. Uh, this example was later reproduced on a great scale in the United States. And it's not because I'm speaking with Americans, but uh, 
such is in my opinion historical truth. The democratization of museum was really realized in the United States at a great scale and went back to Europe only after the Second World War. But all this is very strongly connected as it's easy to see with the history of capitalism, if, if you wish, the transformations of industry, uh, the transformations uh, which uh, involved also uh, the changing working hours, for instance, eight hours working days, uh, opening of museum on Sundays, which was uh, object of a real battle in New York, for instance, not so in Boston. So, uh, 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 yes, uh, my, you know, uh, as a historian, I was formed uh, by a social and economic history. Uh, and uh, for me, museum cannot be understood without all this social and economic context. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> Other questions? Casper. Uh, yes, I apologize. I was briefly removed from the meeting. I had connection issues. Um, first of all, thank you so much for, for writing a, a truly transnational history of the museum. Um, in my own experience, I always find that museum histories tend to be too parochial and, and concentrate on specific national contexts. And so this is something to really look forward to, to me. Um, but I, I have a question which arises um, from some of the things that have already been asked um, to do with, with definitions. I mean, obviously, to, in writing a history like this, you have to have your de definitions. You know, what is a museum? What is a collection? And so on. And um, you already, I, I like the way you answered uh, Peter's question about archives um, and libraries and museums, uh, the way you concentrated on epistemological uh, differences. And I wanted to ask you whether you could do the same for uh, collections and assemblages, um, because you, you mentioned hunter-gatherers who um, have their own collections. And there are archaeologists who, who say that we should look at them as, as collections rather than assemblages. Is, is there something, you do, do you do, draw a difference between assemblages and collections? So Christoph, the, the question, I don't know if you caught it, it's looking at the, the first of your typological distinctions mm -hmm. between what hunter-gatherers assemble and then the collections uh, the sacred collections in treasuries that emerge at the next stage. So Casper is an archaeologist, and he's thinking about assemblage versus collection. What do each of these terms signify for thinking about um, the collecting of objects? Now, this, I must say, I don't uh, really understand the question. I don't know what to what to answer. I guess well, it's because you stressed that um, the private collection is something very unusual in history. Um, and, and this is my question, where, where do you draw the line? What is it, the minimum for a private collection? Why can um, an assemblage of um, hunter-gatherer um, personal adornments not be, it, why is this not a collection? Or, or when does it start being a private collection? <laughs> Uh, what? No, Peter, I, I, I call sorry. once more your help. Yeah, so, no, so the, the hunter-gatherer, the hunter, the, hunter the hunter-gatherer in early, early times has a collection of uh, jewelry, let's say. Is that a collection, the way princely collections later or uh, uh, bourgeois collections or um, ancient Middle East collections or collections, or is there some difference between individual collecting in the Paleolithic and Neolithic from later collections? Uh, well, uh, I don't know whether I, uh, 
I really answered the question. Uh, private collection, as uh, I presume I said, is a very uh, rare phenomenon. It appears twice, uh, in, uh, once in China, one in, once in Rome. In both cases, with the appearance of some kind of aristocracy with inverted commas, uh, because uh, there are great differences between them, but uh, there are similarities too. And then it reappears in the 14th century among, uh, on the one side, in the courts, Italian courts, and among uh, urban patric patriciate in Italian uh, cities, and uh, a bit later in uh, Flemish and um, uh, Rhine uh, cities. And uh, uh, this tradition since then, since the 14th century and 15th century, uh, this tradition is preserved and uh, it uh, there is something very interesting some kind of pressure on private collecting to make their collections public this is also a, a roman tradition which arrived uh, to our days and before our days uh, to people in uh, the second half of the 14th century uh, through the images, through the agency of Pliny's uh, natural history. Uh, so there is a, a complex relationship between private collecting and public collecting. Uh, as I said previously, in, uh, for instance, in the United States of uh, the late 19th and 20th centuries, uh, most of important private collections ended as public collections, ended in museums. Uh, I don't know whether it's, it is the answer to, uh, to the question. I'm afraid it isn't, but... Well, Christoph, if, if I could just jump in, I mean, are you saying that actually looking at the long view of human history, that the, the, the presumption is that collections are not private and that, in fact, the, the breakthrough to private collection is rare and is due to specific contexts which we might say belong to the empowering of the individual against the collective. But that in human history from the beginning of society until now, it's the weight of society that actually keeps collections, uh, if not public, then not private. And that the rarity is the private, which is the function of very specific historical circumstances. So uh, I think so. Uh, in a sense, a private collection is some kind of uh, Lust der Vernunft uh, of, uh, of uh, the uh, ruse, I don't, I don't know the English term uh, for that, uh, which, which makes that uh, people collect uh, even very, uh, very frequently with completely selfish uh, intentions. But the final result of this is that uh, objects which were uh, inaccessible to the majority of people becomes, become uh, accessible to them uh, because private collection and very frequently uh, 
and with the time more frequently uh, in public museums. And for me, public museums is a pleonasmic. Museum is public by definition. Do we have uh, other questions on the panel? I have, I have a question from the audience. The question from the audience, Christoph, is about whether, whether you can or whether you should include in the history of museums the different histories of care for objects. In other words, is the history of collecting only a history of gathering, or is it also a history of care? It's also a history of care, uh, so much so that, uh, uh, that uh, so to say you, you cannot even uh, write correctly a history of museums in several countries without, at the same time, taking into account uh, 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 legal uh, legal regulations concerning the protection of monuments, protection of objects, etc. Uh, so, uh, uh, history of care uh, uh, concerning uh, objects, movable or immovable, uh, is part of this history. Well, uh, the rest is simply the problem of uh, human finitude that you cannot uh, study everything. But uh, it happens that in my book, uh, there is a lot of uh, place devoted to, um, uh, to the care for objects, as to, to the protection of monuments in particular, and things like that. And this collection is very strongly visible as well in the European cases, some European cases, uh, from this point of view, there are great differences between countries. There's a difference, for instance, between France and uh, United Kingdom. But uh, once more, a very interesting case is, uh, is Japan, where uh, the care for objects and the establishment of museums are strongly connected one to another. <clears throat> I'm wondering, as we come to the end of our conversation, if we could do a, a little um, thought experiment. So your book, the, the three books, really um, focus on the museum as this um, Western category that globalizes itself. And then with the nuance of the different uh, adaptations, Japan, India, et cetera. What would happen, and maybe this is an unfair question, but that's why I'm doing it at the end so I can uh, escape afterwards if it's unfair. Um, what would happen if, if you turn things around and wrote a history of collecting institutions from the point of view of China and Chinese collecting institutional individual and then looking out to the rest of the world from China, would how would the categories with which you think of the history of collecting, how might they change? And how might we think of the whole notion of adaptation differently if we looked at it sort of from a, a China-centered historical perspective? Well, I'm not a Chinese historian, so it's a bit difficult to answer. But uh, I would say this. China has, uh, in, in contradistinction uh, to Europe, China has an uninterrupted history of collecting starting uh, 
somewhere in the uh, third or second century before our era until today. So that is the first point. Uh, uh, I don't uh, know of uh, history of this collecting. I would read it with an enormous interest if it were written and uh, translated from Chinese, which unhappily I don't know. Uh, but uh, where there, be, there will be an interesting break in this history. It will continue until the 20th century. But the history of museum wouldn't be uh, a direct continuity of this history of collecting as it is in Europe. Because the museum arrived to China uh, from Europe, and the first museums in China were created uh, by uh, uh, English living in Macau, by uh, English living in uh, Shanghai, by uh, French Jesuits. Uh, and uh, the first museum, Chinese museum created by a Chinese dates from uh, 1905. If I remember well, I, I may be mistaken on date. Uh, and it was created not so much under uh, looking at European example, but after the visit, uh, this gentleman who was a very important figure uh, of politician, industrialist, uh, etc., who created uh, museum is in his city after a visit to Japan. Uh, so, uh, in this case, uh, a history written from a Chinese point of view would have. Uh, some kind of breaking off of continuity. Museum arrives from outside to China. With, with the agency of Japan, uh, uh, but, uh, but we know that this gentleman knew perfectly well uh, a museum created in Shanghai um, uh, uh, by uh, an uh, local uh, local um, uh, Asiatic society. He was even on the board of trustees of it, so he knew the institution. But it's really after his visit to Japan that he himself created a museum. And uh, for the rest, uh, uh, the, the, the creation of the great uh, uh, National Museum was the effect of the revolution of 1911 and uh, a bit later of the uh, uh, expulsion of the former emperor from the Forbidden City in Beijing and uh, then the creation by uh, Republican authorities of the museum there it was in the 1920s, I don't remember the exact date. Thank you very much, Christoph. Uh, so I think we are, we're past our time. I want to, uh, to thank our panelists, thank our audience for joining us today for this discussion. Uh, and above all, Christoph, thank you for interrupting uh, your day, your early evening, to talk to us here in New York. We're very grateful. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining us here. Well, I wanted to thank every, uh, you in particular and everybody for having participated in this webinar. For me, it was extremely interesting and stimulating. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christoph. We'll talk some more soon. <laughs>